Hello, and welcome back to ASMR Leadership, where I read to you from books with a leadership or personal development focus, because spoken word ASMR, mouth sounds, and gentle page turning help me to relax, and I trust the same is true for you. Also, my feeling is that if you're going to invest the time in a long ASMR video, you should at least come away having learned something. So today, I bring you Chapter 3 of Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. Oh, and tonight, I'm sipping on some scotch too. So we're all going to find out how this goes. Chapter 3 He who can do this has the whole world with him. He who cannot walks a lonely way. I often went fishing up in Maine during the summer. Personally, I am very fond of strawberries. But I have found that for some strange reason, fish prefer worms. So when I went fishing, I didn't think about what I wanted. I thought about what they wanted. I didn't bait the hook with strawberries. Rather, I dangled a worm or a grasshopper in front of the fish and said, wouldn't you like to have that? Why not use the same common sense when fishing for people? This is what George Excuse me, this is what Lloyd George, Great Britain's Prime Minister during World War I, did. When someone asked him how he managed to stay in power after other wartime leaders, Wilson, Orlando, and Clemenceau, had been forgotten, he replied that if his staying on top might be attributed to any one thing, it would be to his having learned that it was necessary to bait the hook to suit fish. Why talk about what we want? This is childish. Absurd. Of course, if you're, of course you're interested in what you want. You are eternally interested in it, but no one else is. The rest of us are just like you. We are interested in what we want. So the only way on earth to influence other people is to talk about what they want and to show them how to get it. Remember that tomorrow, remember that tomorrow when you are trying to get somebody to, to do something. If, for example, you don't want your children to smoke, don't preach at them. And don't talk about what you want, but show them that cigarettes may keep them from making the basketball team or winning the hundred yard dash. This is a good thing to remember regardless whether you are dealing with children or calves or chimpanzees. For example, one day Ralph Waldo Emerson and his son tried to get a calf into the barn. But they made the common mistake of thinking only of what they wanted. Emerson pushed and his son pulled. But the calf was doing just what the, but the calf was doing just what they were doing. He was thinking only of what he wanted. So he stiffened his legs and stubbornly refused to leave the pasture. The Irish housemaid saw their predicament. She couldn't write essays and books, but on this occasion at least, she had more horse sense or calf sense than Emerson had. She thought of what the calf wanted, so she put her maternal finger in the calf's mouth and let the calf suck her finger as she gently led him into the barn. Every act you have ever performed since the day you were born was performed because you wanted something. How about the time you gave a large contribution to the Red Cross? Yes, that is no exception to the rule. You gave the Red Cross the donation because you wanted to lend a helping hand. You wanted to do a beautiful, unselfish, divine act. Inasmuch as ye have done it unto the least of these, of my, bre my brethren, ye have done it unto me. If you hadn't wanted that feeling more than you wanted your money, you would not have made the contribution. Of course. 
course you might have made the contribution because you were ashamed to refuse or because a customer asked you to do it. But one thing is certain, you made the contribution because you wanted something. Harry A. Overstreet, in his illuminating book, Influencing Human Behavior, said, Action springs out of what we fundamentally desire, and the best piece of advice which can be given to would-be persuaders, whether in business, in the home, in the school, or in politics, is, first arouse in the other person an eager want. He who can do this has the whole world with him. He who cannot walks a lonely way. Andrew Carnegie, the poverty-stricken Scotch lad who started, who started to work at two cents an hour and finally gave away $365 million, learned early in life that the only way to influence people is to talk in terms of what the other person wants. He attended school only four years, yet he learned how to handle people. To illustrate, his sister-in-law was worried sick over her two boys. They were at Yale, and they were so busy with their own affairs that they neglected to write home and paid no attention whatsoever to their mother's frantic letters. Then Carnegie offered to wager a hundred dollars that he could get an answer by return mail, without even asking for it. Someone called his bet, so he wrote his nephews a chatty letter, mentioning casually in a postscript that he was sending each one a five-dollar bill. He neglected, however, to enclose the money. Back came replies by return mail, thinking, Dear Uncle Andrew, thanking dear Uncle Andrew for his kind note. You can finish the sentence yourself. Another example of persuading comes from Stam Novak of Cleveland, Ohio, a participant in our course. Stan came home from work one evening to find his youngest son, Tim, kicking and screaming on the living room floor. He was to start kindergarten the next day and was protesting that he would not go. Stan's normal reaction would have been to banish the child to his room and tell him he'd bit and tell him he'd better make up his mind to go. He had no choice. But tonight, recognizing that this would not really help Tim start kindergarten in the best frame of mind, Stan sat down and thought, if I were Tim, why would I be excited about going to kindergarten? He and his wife made a list of all the fun things Tim would do, such as finger painting, singing songs, making new friends. Then they put them into action. We all started finger painting on the kitchen table. My wife, Lil, my other son, Bob, and myself all having fun. Soon Tim was peeping around the corner. Next he was begging to participate. Oh no, you have to go to kindergarten first to learn how to finger paint. With all the enthusiasm I could muster, I went through the list in talking. I went through the list talking in terms he could understand, telling him all the fun he would have in kindergarten. The next morning, I thought I was the first one up. I went downstairs and found him sitting sound asleep in the living room chair. What are you doing here? I asked. I'm waiting to go to kindergarten. I don't want to be late. The enthusiasm of our entire family had aroused in Tim an eager want that no amount of discussion or threat could have possibly accomplished. Tomorrow you may want to persuade somebody to do something. Before you speak, pause and ask yourself, how can I make this person want to do it? The question will stop. The question will stop us from rushing into a situation heedlessly with future chatter about our desires. At one time, I rented the grand ballroom of a certain New York City hotel for 20 nights in each season in order to hold a series of lectures. At the beginning of one season, I was suddenly in 
informed that I should have to pay almost three times as much rent as formerly. This news reached me after the tickets had been printed and distributed, and all the announcements had been made. Any one secret of success, 
it lies in the ability to get the other person's point of view and see things from that person's angle as well as from your own. That is so simple, so obvious, that anyone ought to see the truth of it at a glance. Yet 90% of the people on this earth ignore it 90% of the time. An example. Look at the letters that come across your desk tomorrow, and you will find that most of them violate this important canon of common sense. Take this one, a letter written by the head of the radio department in an advertising agency with offices scattered across the continent. This letter was sent to the managers of local radio stations throughout the country. I have set down in brackets my reactions to each paragraph. Mr. John Blank, Blankville, Indiana. Dear Mr. Blank, the Blank Company desires to retain its position in advertising agency leadership in the radio field. Here's the first reaction from the author. Who cares what your company desires? I am worried about my own problems. The bank is foreclosing the mortgage on my house. The bugs are destroying the hollyhocks. The stock market tumbled yesterday. I missed the, the 815 this morning. I wasn't invited to the Joneses' dance last night. The doctor tells me I have high blood pressure and neur neuritis and dandruff. And then what happens? I come down to the office this morning, open my mail, and here is some little whippersnapper off in New York yapping about what his company wants. Bah. If he only realized what sort of impression his letter makes, he would get out of the advertising business and start manufacturing sheep dip. On with the letter. This agency's national advertising, national advertising accounts were the bulwark of the network. Our subsequent clearances of station time have kept us at the top of agencies year after year. The next reaction. You are big and rich and right at the top, are you? So what? I don't give two hoops in Hades if you are as big as General Motors and General Electric and the general staff of the U.S. Army all combined. If you had as much sense as a half-witted hummingbird, you would realize that I am interested in how big I am, not how big you are. All of this talk about your enormous success makes me feel small and unimportant. One more line from the letter. We desire to service our accounts with the last word on radio station information. The next reaction. You desire. You desire. You unmitigated ass. I'm not interested in what you desire or what the President of the United States desires. Let me tell you once and for all that I am interested in what I desire, and you haven't said a word about that yet in this absurd letter of yours. Back to the letter. Will you, therefore, put the blank company on your preferred list for weekly station information? Every single detail that will be useful in an agency is intelligently booking time. The next reaction. Preferred list. You have the nerve. You make me feel insignificant by your big talk about your company. And then you ask me to put you on a preferred list. And you don't even say please when you ask it. Next line from the letter. A prompt acknowledgement of this letter giving us your latest doings will be mutually helpful. Another reaction. You fool, you mail me a cheap form letter, a letter scattered far and wide like the autumn leaves, and you have the gall to ask me when I am worried about my mortgage and the hollyhocks and my blood pressure to sit down and dictate a personal note acknowledging your form letter, and you ask me to do it promptly. What do you mean, promptly? Don't you know I am just as busy as you are? Or at least I like to think I am. And while we are on the subject, who gave you the lordly right to order me around? 
you say it will be mutually helpful. At last, at last, you have begun to see my viewpoint. But you are vague about how it will be to my advantage. And then the end of the letter. Very truly yours, John Doe, Manager, Radio Department. P.S. The enclosed rep reprint from the Blankville Journal will be of interest to you, and you may want to broadcast it over your station. Final reaction. Finally, down here in the postscript, you mentioned something that may help me solve one of my problems. Why didn't you begin your letter with... But what's the use? Any advertising man who's guilty of perpetrating such drivel as you have sent me has something wrong with his medulla oblongata. You don't need a letter giving our latest doings. What you need is a quart of iodine in your thyroid gland. Now, if people who devote their lives to advertising and who pose as experts in the art of influencing people to buy, if they write a letter like that, what can we expect from the butcher and the baker or the auto mechanic? Here's another letter written by the superintendent of a large freight terminal to a student of, it, of this course, Edward Vermelin. What effect did this letter have on the man to whom it was addressed? Read it, and then I'll tell you. Gentlemen, the operations at our outbound rail receiving station are handicapped because a material percentage of the total business is delivered to us in the late afternoon. This condition results in congestion over time on the part of our forces delays to trucks, and in some cases delays to freight. On November 10th, we received from your company a lot of 510 pieces, which reached here at 4.20 p.m. We solicit your cooperation toward overcoming undesirable effects arising from late, sh from late receipt of freight. May we ask that on days which you ship the volume which was received on the above date, effort be made either to get the truck here earlier or to deliver us part of the freight during the morning. The advantage that would accrue to you under, under such an arrangement would be that of more expeditious discharge of your trucks and the assurance that your business would go forward on the date of its receipt. Very truly yours. service you deserve. 
However, we regret to say that it isn't possible for us to do that when your trucks bring us a large shipment late in the afternoon, as they did on November 10th. Why? Because many other customers make late afternoon deliveries also. Naturally, that causes congestion. <clears throat> that means your trucks are held up unavoidably at the pier, and sometimes even your freight is delayed. That's bad, but it can be avoided. If you make your deliveries at the pier in the morning when possible, your trucks will be able to keep moving, your freight will get immediate attention, and our workers will get home early at night to enjoy a dinner of the delicious macaroni and noodles that you manufacture. Regardless of when your shipments arrive, we shall always cheerfully do all in our power to serve you promptly. You are busy, but please don't trouble to answer this note. Barbara Anderson, who worked at a bank in New York, desired to move to Phoenix, Arizona because of the health of her son. Using the principles she had learned in our course, she wrote the following letter to 12 banks in Phoenix. Dear Sir, My 10 years of bank experience should be of interest to a rapidly growing bank like yours. In various capacities in bank operations with the Bankers Trust Company in New York, leading to my present assignment as branch manager, I have acquired skills in all phases of banking, including depositor relations, credits, loans, and administration. I will be relocating to Phoenix in May, and I'm sure I can contribute to the growth, to your growth and profit. I will be in Phoenix the week of April 3rd, and would appreciate the opportunity to show you how I can help your bank meet its goals. Sincerely, Barbara L. Anderson. Mrs. Anderson received any response from that letter. Eleven of the twelve banks invited her to be interviewed, and she had a choice of which banks offered to accept. Why? Mrs. Anderson did not state what she wanted, but wrote in the letter how she could help them and focused on their interests, their wants, not her own. Thousands of salespeople are pounding the pavement today, tired, discouraged, and underpaid. Why? Because they are always thinking only of what they want. They don't realize that neither you nor I want to buy anything. If we did, we would go out and just buy it. But both of us are eternally interested in solving our problems. And if salespeople can show us how their services or merchandise will help solve our problems. They won't need to sell us. We'll buy. And customers like to feel that they are buying, not being sold. Yet many salespeople spend a lifetime in selling without seeing things from the customer's angle. For example, for many years I lived in Forest Hills, a little community of private homes in the center of Greater New York. One day, as I was rushing to the station, I chanced to meet a real estate operator who had bought and sold property in that area for many years. He knew Forest Hills well, so I hurriedly ask him, asked him whether or not my stucco house was built with metal lath or hollow tile. He said he didn't know and told me what I already knew, that I could find out by calling the Forest Hills Garden Association. The following morning, I received a letter from him. Did he give me the information I wanted? He could have gotten it in 60 seconds by a telephone call, but he didn't. He told me again that I could get it by telephoning, and then asked me to let him handle my insurance. He was not interested in helping me, he was interested only in helping himself. J. Howard Lucas of Birmingham, Alabama tells how two salespeople from the same company handled the same type of situation. He reported, 
Several years ago, I was on the management team of a small company. Headquartered near us was the district office of a large insurance company. Their agents were assigned to territories, and our company was assigned two agents, whom I shall refer to as Carl and John. One morning, Carl dropped by our office and casually mentioned that his company had just introduced a new life insurance policy for executives and thought we might be interested later on, and he would get back to us when he had more information on it. The same day, John saw us on the sidewalk while returning from a coffee break, and he shouted, Hey, Luke, hold up. I have some great news for you fellows. He hurried over and very excitedly told us about an executive life insurance policy his company had introduced that very day. It was the same policy that Carl had casually mentioned. He wanted us to have one of the first issued. He gave us a few important facts about the coverage and ended saying, The policy is so new I'm going to have someone from the home office come out tomorrow and explain it. Now in the meantime, let's get the application signed and on, and on the way so he can have more information to work with. His enthusiasm aroused in us an eager want for this policy, even though we still did not have the details. When they were made available to us, they confirmed John's initial understanding of the policy. And he not only sold each of us a policy, but later doubled our coverage. Carl could have had those sales, but he made no effort to arouse in us any desire for the policies. The world is full of people who are grabbing and self-seeking. So the rare individual who unselfishly tries to serve others has an enormous advantage. He has little competition. Owen D. Young, a noted lawyer and one of America's great business leaders, once said, People who can put themselves in the place of other people who can understand the workings of their minds, need never worry about what the future has in store for them. If out of reading this book you get just one thing, an increased tendency to think always in terms of, the other, of other people's point of view and see things from their angle, if you get that one thing out of this book it may easily prove to be one of the building blocks of your career. Looking at the other person's point of view and arousing in him or her an eager want for something is not to be construed as manipulating that person so that he will do something that is only for your benefit and his detriment. Each party should gain from the negotiation. In the letters to Mr. Vermelin, both the sender and the receiver of the correspondence gained by implementing what was suggested. Both the bank and Mrs. Anderson won by her letter won by her letter in that bank in that the bank obtained a valuable employee and Mrs. Anderson a suitable job. And in the example of John's sale of insurance, Mr. Lucas and in the example of John's sale of insurance to Mr. Lucas both gained through this transaction. Another example in which everybody gains through this principle of arousing an eager want comes from Michael E. Witten of Warwick, Rhode Island, who is a territory salesman for the Shell Oil Company. Mike wanted to become the number one salesperson in his district, but one service station was holding him back. It was run by an older man who could not be motivated to clean up his station. It was in such poor shape that sales were declining significantly. This manager would not listen to any of Mike's pleas to upgrade the station. After many exhortations and heart-to-heart -heart talks, all of which had no impact, Mike decided to invite the manager to visit the newest shell station in his territory. The manager was so impressed by the facilities at the new station that when Mike visited him the next time, his station was cleaned up and had recorded a sales increase.
this enabled Mike to reach the number one spot in his district. All this talking and discussion hadn't helped, but by arousing an eager want in the manager, by showing him the modern station, he had accomplished his goal, and both the manager and Mike benefited. Most people go through college and learn to read Virgil and master the mysteries of calculus without ever discovering how their own minds function. For instance, I once gave a course in effective speaking for the young college graduates who were entering the employ of the Carrier Corporation, the large air conditioner manufacturer. One of the participants wanted to persuade the others to play basketball in their free time. And this is about what he said. I want you to come out and play basketball. I like to play basketball. But the last few times I have been to the gymnasium, there haven't been enough people to get up a game. Two or three of us got to throwing the ball around the other night, and I got a black eye. I wish all of you I wish all of you would have would come down tomorrow night. I want to play basketball. Did he talk about anything you want? You don't want to go to a gymnasium that no one else goes to, do you? You don't care about what he wants. You don't want to get a black eye. He could have shown you. He could have shown you how to get the things you want by using the gymnasium. Surely, more pep, keener edge to the appetite, clearer brain, fun, games, basketball. To repeat Professor Overstreet's wise advice, first arouse in the other person an eager want. He who can do this has the whole world with him. He who cannot walks a lonely way. One of the students in the author's training course was worried about his little boy. The child was underweight and refused to eat properly. His parents used the usual method. They scolded and nagged. Mother wants you to eat this and that. Father wants you to grow up to be a big man. Did the boy pay any attention to these pleas? Just about as much as you pay to one fleck of sand on a sandy beach. No one with a trace of horse sense would expect a child three years old to react to the viewpoint of a father thirty years old. Yet that was yet that was precisely what the father had expected. It was absurd. He finally saw that. So he said to himself, What does that boy want? How can I tie up what I want to what he wants? It was easy for the father when he started thinking about it. His boy had a tricycle that he loved to ride up and down the sidewalk in front of the house in Brooklyn. A few doors down the street lived a bully, a bigger boy who would pull the little boy off his tricycle and ride it himself. Naturally, the little boy would run screaming to his mother, and she would have to come out and take the bully off the tricycle and put her little boy on again. This happened almost every day. Boy. <clears throat> that was a big one. <clears throat> what did the little boy want? It didn't take a Sherlock Holmes to answer that one. His pride, his anger, his desire for a feeling of importance. All the strongest emotions in his makeup goaded him to get revenge, to smash the bully in the nose, and when his father explained that the boy would be able to wallop the daylights out of the bigger kid someday, if he would only eat the things his mother wanted him to eat, when his father promised him that, there was no longer any problem of dietetics. That boy would have eaten spinach, sauerkraut, salt mackerel, anything in order to be big enough to whip the bully who had, humi who had humiliated him so often. After solving that problem, the parents tackled another. The little boy had
arose in the other person an eager want. Well, I sincerely appreciate you hanging with me for chapter three of Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. Uh, join me again for chapter four in the next video. Maybe I'll be trying a different scotch in that one. Almost done. sleep now. Hopefully you have to